Hello, I'm Tara Brabazon. I'm the Dean of Graduate Research at Flinders University and welcome to Vlog 79. Amazing! Vlog 79 methodology and yes, this is the last installment in our Three Wise Monkeys series. And I want to do a particular shout out if I can to Tanya. Thank you Tanya for this remarkable suggestion to do methodology a couple of months ago. I'm finally delivering it to you. And can I also do a big shout out to all my dear friends and colleagues at the University of Plymouth and also the University of the West of Scotland who have been just offering some fantastic commentary and feedback on Facebook, on LinkedIn and also on Twitter. So a big hello to all of you. Miss you. You are amazing scholars, amazing people. Cheers. So methodology is an interesting one because it seems the simplest of our three wise monkeys, almost commonsensical. And I'm arguing today that's almost part of of the danger. Because if we select and discuss very simple methodologies, then how can we reach the heights that we expect of epistemology and ontology? So that's where we're going to start today. There's an old truth from my wonderful mother, Doris. Hi, Doris Brabazon. She's 87 years of age. And she always taught her children that if you want a different outcome, then you have to do something differently. So if you want the same stuff to keep happening, well you just keep doing the same stuff. But if you want something different to emerge, then you have to behave differently. You have to act differently. And that's quite a provocative maxim, I think, when we're considering research. Because if I want you to configure an original contribution to knowledge, then you can't do the same old stuff in the same old way. Your ontology, the foundation for your domain of knowledge, must be clear, succinct and stable. Your epistemology must be articulate, articulated and also precise. But when that work is done, the time has come to think about the how and indeed the why of the how. You start to think about your methodologies. Now, my issue is, and it's really an issue in international higher education, and this is a problem, uh, a frustration, if you like, that I've experienced for really the last 20 years. And it's about the very simplistic discussions that take place with methodology. And I'll give you an example of this. One of my great PhD students was doing her confirmation of candidature, not at Flinders University, can I say. And one of the reviewers, a professor no less, asked my student, well, where are your surveys? Where are your interviews? Where, where are your questionnaires? And my st student responded quite rightly, well, I'm, I'm sorry, but this is a project where I'm enacting a policy analysis and I'm using unobtrusive research methods. Correct, spot on. But then the reviewer, in the middle of the confirmation of candidature, spat out, well, I've never even heard of unobtrusive research methods. Like she was sort of like, a wizard and like because she hadn't heard of it it didn't exist isn't ignorance a funny thing but that's a great example of well unless you were doing these particular types of methods then your research doesn't actually exist and is not verifiable and so as you can see all sorts of naivety exists around our discussion of research methods and the belief in the empirical the blind almost evangelical belief in the empirical always makes me smile and I'll tell you why I always remember one of the early times that I taught methodology to second year students and what I did was I walked into the lecture theatre and I pretended to the students that I was going to give them a quiz, a spot quiz. I said, ladies and gentlemen, uh, to start the lecture today I'm actually going to conduct a spot quiz on methodology. So I handed out a sheet and I said to my students, right, please put your name and your student number at the top of that piece of paper. And as you can see, we've got 10 questions to answer. I'm about to ask those questions. And you can see on your piece of paper, I've got numbers in place, one through 10. So please place your answer next to the appropriate number. I can be quite a staunch examiner. Now I then proceeded to ask a series of questions. I'll give you a few of the more tame questions that I asked them of the 10. You might like to think about how you'd respond uh, to these questions in a spot quiz. When was the last time 
you had sexual intercourse? <laughs> Have you ever had a one night stand? <laughs> Do you smoke marijuana? Have you ever been in a house where someone has done a line of cocaine? Have you ever stolen anything from a shop? Do you look at your partner's emails? And yes, do you watch online pornography? Right, so obviously I didn't collect that sheet up, I didn't mark it, it wasn't a spot quiz, it was a ruse. But I went through this process for a reason, and that reason is I was trying to teach my students something about methodology. Never assume that if you ask someone a question about their lives, that they will tell you the truth, because people lie. And if you've, got, <laughs> if you've got a strong epistemology and a strong ontology in place, then you've got a robust mechanism through which you can manage the lies. So never assume if you simply ask someone a question that they're going to tell you the truth about their lives. So methodologies need to be tempered by ontologies and epistemologies. And indeed, the more juicy the topic, sex, drugs, rock and roll, all the good stuff, the less likely your research subjects are to tell you the truth. Because then I asked my students when I revealed the ruse in that lecture theatre and I said to my 136 second year students, I said, guys, how many of you did actually lie on that questionnaire? How many of you actually did put down an incorrect answer? And all 136 students put up their hand. Every single one of them lied at least once. So therefore, if you've got a belief in the qual or the quant, that's great. If you've got a belief in the empirical, that's great. Just remember though, my spot quiz in that lecture theater, that just because you're asking someone to tell you a truth, doesn't mean they will. And that's why you require robust, robust methodologies. So let's get into our quick and dirty definitions as we've done the last few weeks. So methodology is the predictable, conscious, theoretical investigation and analysis of methods. And methodology particularly explores how it appears and operates within a discipline, a topic, or a domain of knowledge. So methods and methodologies are pretty radically different entities. Methodologies assess the theoretical underpinnings of a method. Now, methodologies quite frequently are housed within particular disciplines and they don't move carefully or well or easily between those disciplines. And that's where we start to talk about methodology as involving the systematic theoretical investigation of methods within a particular discipline. Now, for my interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary, antidisciplinary, postdisciplinary mates out there, you rock, but you're aware of the sort of challenges that we're going to confront almost on a daily basis because the assumptions that we're making about methodologies are very rarely shared between disciplines. So you're going to get a lot of heat and there's going to be a lot of challenges that you're going to go through, not only with the examination of your PhD, but also moving through refereed publications because many people, many scholars, are very, very closed in their discussion of method and methodology and interdisciplinary scholars are very open and welcoming of that diversity. So just be aware of the difference there. So methodology, if you will, is the general strategy through which you're going to undertake your project. It reveals how your research is going to be undertaken and the research methods within it. Okay, so this means basically how your data is going to be analysed, how your research outcomes or explanations will be developed and how your original contribution to knowledge will be achieved. So the how does matter here and it must be overt and transparent and demonstrate your accountability. 
But the point of methodology is twofold. It is more than simply the how. You have to explain why you have chosen these particular methods over others and the strengths and the weaknesses of those methods and your decision making. And you also have to, too, demonstrate the repeatability of your research. Often <laughs> we forget in the middle of a doctorate when we're fighting with EndNote that the point of methods, indeed the point of referencing if I can state more generally, is to ensure that your examiners and also other readers and researchers can follow your outcomes and follow your arguments and see how you got there. So there's a transparency and an accountability there. We need to be showing your rigour and the way we show rigor is through methods and methodology, you explaining why you've made those decisions. So as you can see, methodology, therefore, is really complex and it's also very intricate. Too often it's reified to qualitative and quantitative. I really don't like that. I prefer to group or house my discussion of methods in two parts. So the empirical analytical group of methods and the interpretive group of methods. So the empirical analytical group is most frequently found in the sciences and the harder end of the social sciences. It focuses on objective knowledge. It evokes clear research questions and concrete answers to those research questions. There are measurable operational variables, deductive reasoning is in place, and it is an explanatory approach, right? So that's the empirical analytical group. For many of you, that's exactly what you're doing, and that's cool, that's great, but just know there is actually another group as well, which is the interpretive group of methods that we find in the humanities and the high-end, high-theoretical social sciences. So this is a comprehensive or holistic methodology. It deploys interpretive methods, so it probes meaning-making strategies, so how we make sense of the world. That's what we do in this particular methods group, and it also is very subjective. It's not pretending to be objective at all, it is subjective, and often the researcher's subjective experiences link in some way to the research that's being undertaken. So methodology, whether we're talking about a paper or a book or indeed your thesis, has two parts. What we're interested in, okay, how was the data collected and generated? And then how was it analyzed? You need to do both. The writing should be clear, it should be precise, and yes, it should be written in the past tense. Now, all those rules that I'm talking about apply whether we're dealing with unobtrusive research methods, qual or quant, learning-led, teaching-led research, or creative-led, practice-led research, right? Basically, what we need is your readers and your examiners, no less, need to see how you have made the decisions that you've made because unreliable methods create unreliable results and they undermine your credibility. Methodology at its best provides the justification of why you have chosen one set of methods over another. And please remember, this is so important, the problems that emerge in the application of a method are not an issue. People go, oh, stuff's gone wrong. Examiners, readers, researchers, we love it when stuff goes wrong. So please don't hide or mask or fusticate, you know, something that's gone wrong in your methods. Some of the best work we ever see in research methodologies occur when stuff goes wrong. Some of the best examination results I've ever had, I'm thinking of three of my wonderful PhD students, methodology, just about everything went wrong. And in the oral exam, we sort of were tortured and they were asked questions about the methodology and everyone absolutely loved it. They went straight through, they passed their PhDs with ease and the examiners commented on how reflexive and transparent they were in their methodology. So just remember, put the problem into the work. Don't hide it. The problems in methodology are really interesting. The worst work I ever see in methodology, and wow, I see it in a lot of theses, uh, paragraph after paragraph after paragraph after paragraph after paragraph about how the research was undertaken. 
So remember, methodology is not a how-to guide of a particular method. Instead, it investigates your application of that method. So let me show you the difference here. I've got a prop again, but let me show you the difference. So methodology, right? What does it look like? Say we're doing a crossword, right? Now, a really poor description of methodology starts with, right, how do I do a crossword? Uh, I get a pen. I'll find a crossword. And then I put little letters in the boxes. That's a poor description of methods. <laughs> a better description of methodology in terms of a crossword starts with, right, well, I assess the crossword, I fill in the answers to the questions about which I'm absolutely certain. So I fill in the answers to the questions that I know are correct. And then I assess the probability of the remaining questions, noting the new information I now have via the complete answers to other predictable questions. So I then fill in each answer by level of probability. That's methodology in filling out a crossword. So as you can see, fascinating area. This is really gutsy and interesting, but the errors in methodology, when they do occur, are really deal breakers. So in an examination of a PhD, if there are errors in methodology, that's often the reason that theses fail. So it seemed to be the simplest area. Actually, it is the deal breaker in terms of corrections. So if students in particular do not report the problems, the difficulties involved in gathering up data, but also the gaps in the archival material, then you're opening yourself out to descriptions like bad science. Then in terms of examination, things get a little bit difficult. So what I want you to do is present the gaps, present the problems, and explain how you managed those problems. That's a really fantastic methodological discussion. So for those of you right in the middle of the methodology swamp right now, or those of you who are just now doing your final drafting on your thesis and are reviewing, right, well, how does my methodology actually operate in my thesis? Here's a bit of a checklist for you to consider. So basically, how did you do your research and why did you make that decision? So that's when we move from methods to methodology, the how to the why. Why did you choose your theoretical framework, your epistemology, and how has your epistemology framed and shaped your methodology? Yeah. Now, for the hard sciences, you choose your materials, your methods, your procedures based on repeatability the importance of the repeatability of your research. For the social sciences, you select your methods to align with your research questions. So how the data was collected, analysed, what is your evidential base? And then you have to justify your sampling about whether it is or was representative or illustrative. Both are fine, but you've got to be clear about why you made those decisions. Now for the humanities, we all have to choose why those sources were chosen. How did they fit into your research question? It's obviously in the singular most frequently in the humanities or indeed how your methods fit into your thesis statement. And then are your sources representative or illustrative? And what approach did you select for your interpretation and why? Always remember that all methods, even mixed methods, only give a view or a very limited vista of what is possible in research. And look, there are some incredibly innovative methodologies that are emerging all around us. For example, in the last 15 years or so, I've really been fascinated by the research methodology of yarning that exists within Indigenous research. And in the last week alone, I've been reading these amazing articles that have emerged in 2017 about yarning in terms of collaborative research and creating post-colonial research strategies for a post-colonial higher education institution. 
So yarning, I think, is one great research methodology to watch. And I hope at some stage at Flinders we have a wonderful PhD student that decides to actually look at yarning as a research method for the entirety of their thesis. It's exciting, it's innovative, it's powerful, and it's passionate. So as you can see, methodology is not boring. It's not like, how I did this, yawn, 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 yawn. Methodology is a chance to show that you are a scholar, that you think theoretically about procedures, about policies, about processes, and you demonstrate the validity of your sources, really powerful, and you care about the whys of research as much as the hows. So I've loved the last three vlogs. I hope they've been useful to you. Thank you for following me on the journey through the three wise monkeys. I wish you as always love, light and peace. <laughs> Cheers. Tea out.